So, you know, I've been talking in the past about how I've been struggling with my relationship with Facebook. So, um, again, just to give you an update, it's, it's still under control, alhamdulillah, um, but I do spend some time on there and um, try to find the right, the right balance. But while I was on, I actually saw a post recently that caught my attention that I wanted to talk about. Um, there was a, a Muslim woman counselor in, the, in New Jersey, and she had shared a post because she had given a lecture at um, one of the Islamic conferences, and she was traveling in Ohio. And she was speaking to a group of teenagers, about 100 of them, um, aged about 13 through 18. And the topic was gender, interaction, and dating. And so after the whole session ended, at the end she said, does anybody have any questions? And it was like utter silence. So she thought, okay, well maybe people are embarrassed. So she said, here, take my text, my, my cell phone number, and if you have any questions, feel free to text me. And she was just expecting that maybe a handful of people would actually write to her. So she was really surprised when she went home um, or to the hotel in that evening, and over the course of the evening, even long after the conference was over, she got a total of over 100 text messages from 79 different teenagers who attended the session. And some of them had not even gone to the session, but just heard about it. And um, so the range of questions was, you know, of course, from LGBTQ related, like 49% of her questions were related to that, things like, can I be friends with a gay person? Can I be gay? Can I, you know, just any, you know, related topic to, or question to that. Um, about 19% were related to hijab. Like, is it, you know, really something that we have to do? I don't want to do it. Um, is it necessary? Um, and then other questions that were even more serious, like, you know, I don't know if I believe in God anymore. Um, what do I do? Um, I'm really depressed. Um, and I don't, you know, feel sometimes like this life is worth living um, to, you know, is it, is marijuana um, and vaping truly haram? But, um, you know, so it ran the gamut. And she stayed up all night answering every single text message. And as a response, many people wrote back and, and said, I can't believe that you were actually, that you answered me, you know, or wow, you know, I wasn't expecting a response. And, um, and she sensed like, you know, in all of these messages, just an underlying you know, tone of depression, desperation, loneliness, fear, kind of like no place to turn. So she wrote on her Facebook post, you know, that how heartbreaking this was for her because she's, you know, an educator, she's a counselor, she speaks to groups, and how, you know, have we as adults failed our youth by not sort of creating that safe space where they feel comfortable asking really important questions. And, you know, she was wondering, like, well, where are our kids turning? Because she even said, you know, the issue now is not so much about you know how many hours are we our kids spending on video games or on social media or you know, who are their friends, but it was something much deeper. And she identified that as sort of a issue with communication. Um, so you know I thought that that was very interesting. I mean the first thing um, it made me think a lot about you know obviously the big question on a lot of people's minds you know as they're thinking about kids or if they have kids or if they're you know um, just had kids. You know how how do I teach my kids about Islam and about God and you know how do I instill them with the love for this religion and um, I just wanted to comment first that what was sort of striking to me this woman you know she um, was obviously very smart and articulate and nice and caring but it was like um, in this Islamic conference setting and um, it reminded me of my feeling when I was first a convert and attended my first large Islamic conference. And it made me honestly quite uh, feel a bit of an outsider because, you know, I looked at this space, and actually, so I, I was searching around actually just to give you a little bit of background. I was looking her up and looked on YouTube and I actually got a chance to watch her give her talk about that whole experience with the teenagers the next day. She was speaking to the parents and trying to tell them, you know, I was gonna talk about something else, but this was so alarming to me that I wanted to talk about this and, you know, and advise people about how to address this communication issue. Um, you know, and she was wearing her purple hijab, she had her jilbab, she was sitting alongside um, Imam Siraj Wahaj and another person got up and, you know, barely anyone was there. And it just felt like, you know, when you enter, I don't know if this is just me because I don't have a lot of experience with these kinds of things, but entering, I felt like, okay, this is not something, I feel very foreign, you know, watching this. Like, it, she, she's very smart and whatever, but I don't relate to her, like, in terms of how she looks. 
in terms of how she speaks, you know, like kind of standing up and rattling off a bunch of Arabic and throwing in Arabic words in, you know, the middle of her talk as if we should know what it is. And as a non-Arabic speaker, you know, when she says stuff like, well, you know, um, at this stage of Tarbiya, and this stage of Tarbiya, and this stage of Tarbiya, and I'm like, what's Tarbiya? So of course I Google Tarbiya, sorry, <laughs> your institute is called Tarbiya. And it's like growth and, um, you know, learning. And so her, what she was trying to say is, you know, when kids are growing, they grow, you know, like the three stages are from age zero to seven, and then eight to 11, and then 12 up, something like that. I'm like, well, why didn't you just say stages of learning, you know? But again, it was like a very, um, you know, like I was thinking about my 14-year-old son, and I'm like, he would not relate to any of that. He would be very turned off, um, and I would feel like I would be embarrassed to bring my non-Muslim friends, who are very open-minded and loving and, you know, accepting, um, to that space, because it would just, you know, it was embarrassing. And um, so I you know, started thinking, well, why is it like that? I and mean, we weren't in a third world country, we that was Ohio, you know, and it was in the U.S., and they were speaking to a lot of kids and you know when you talk about wanting to inspire kids and having kids feel like connected to your community um, you know I just felt really alienated and I was like why do we do that like I I feel like if we're going to you know be exciting for humanity non-muslims for our kids you know for even for ourselves like I would envision, you know, something exciting, like you know, an Apple product launch, you know, something that really pulls people in, but you know, at a humanistic, social justice, you know, values, virtues level. So um, I mean, it's something to think about. But my talk is not to critique Islamic aesthetics at conferences, because I mean, that's a whole separate issue altogether. But um, what I wanted to talk more was about sort of the substance of what she was talking about and kind of how do we um, think about how we raise our children? Because um, I also did some searching, you know, to see what else is out there, right? So you wanted, I wanted to see Islamically who's speaking about raising children. And what I found was even worse, where it's like, I don't know, I, I can't, it's like I think I blocked it, because it's like watching something where you start by, you know, reciting Quran, and then it just, I mean, it was so, um, lacking in, I think, understanding the challenges that our youth go through. So I wanted to share, you know, I obviously didn't grow up as a Muslim. I converted when I was 27. You know, I wasn't raised, like, with, you know, learning Arabic or going to Islamic schools on the weekends or um, anything like that. So, but it was important to me as a parent, you know, um, to think carefully about, well, you know, when I have children, how do I want to introduce this concept? How, how, you know, how do I make them fall in love with God? How do I make them want to be, you know, Muslim? And what does that actually mean for them? And how do they carry that with them going forward? And, you know, and I, I understand, like, uh, you know, we are really um, dealing with a lot of the immigrant attitudes. So, you know, when I grew up, you know, my family they were Taiwanese immigrants, and for me as a child, I was clearly like a second-class citizen, right? I mean, I was not someone who you know, kids were like either, you know, like servants or, you know, it's like you just, kids were managed, you know, you weren't like real people where, um, you know, at least for me and from my, my experience. And so I was always taught with like this, you have to respect your elders, you have to respect your elders to the point where I was like fearful of elders, you know, and every time I did something wrong, it was like, you know, my parents would yell at me or they would, you know, just tell me I'd stop doing that. And so there's always this sort of like underlying fear of authority. And um, so, so when I met the professor and we, you know, and I had been a Muslim for a year, and then I met Sharif, and Sharif was about four going on five. I remember being really shocked because the professor said to me, you know, I made a point to raise Sharif through reasoning and through developing his intellect. So when something would go wrong or he would do something wrong, I would sit down and explain to him and we would reason through it because I wanted to respect him, you know, as a person. And I, I just thought, that is so weird. You know, I just didn't get it at all. Um, but, you know, it was a really important lesson. So, um, so when we actually, you know, when we met and married, I was now like about 28 and I had been a Muslim for about a year. So I converted before I met the professor. And my first year was really just um, immersion in sort of Wahhabi um, culture. So um, when we married, I was kind of brand new on three fronts immediately. I was like new wife, new mother, 
and Nubostam because I was really at the beginning of my journey. I, you know, so I had been had that what Wahhabi experience for the first year, but I was really starting my journey as kind of a Muslim that followed what we teach here at the Asuli Institute, which is really kind of about you know developing yourself and understanding who you are and your purpose and your strength and all of that. So I was really you know starting with zero, and so it was really stressful because you know I didn't know anything and everything was sort of uncertain and everything was sort of unstable. And, you know, all of a sudden I had a five-year-old, you know, which was like, ah. Um, but, you know, it was um, the most important lesson that I learned from that time, um, for me, is that, you know, when you are all of a sudden a wife or all of a sudden a spouse um, or a parent, the, the default that you fall to is what you learned from your own examples in your life, so from your parents. And, you know, it's just all you know, right? It's just what you've seen and what you've thought about. Um, and so, you know, I, and my experiences, you know, from my parents were not, you know, ideal and they weren't certainly divinely inspired or even, you know, directed towards anything divine. So it was a huge opportunity, um, to rethink everything. And I think that, you know, being a convert, I, you know, rethought everything about my religion and I chose that I wanted to be Muslim. And it's sort of interesting, it's like you, when you become a new wife and a new mother, you can actually have a conversion experience too, because it's an opportunity to sort of question everything that you understood about growing up and being raised and how you want to raise yourself. And you can choose aspirationally what you want to be. And that was a really valuable lesson for me, and it was a liberating lesson for me, but it was also a very hard lesson for me, because as you grow up, you know, those things are, are like instilled in you, they're stamped in you, they're part of your DNA, like how your parents raised you and how you think about, you know, marriage and, and all of, and you know, how to be a parent. Um, so, but I think what's exciting is to the idea that you can choose and you can make a change. Um, so, so interestingly, so when Sharif, um, when I first encountered Sharif, he was five, and um, my first thought was, okay, he is my stepson, but I'm not going to think of him as my stepson. He is my son through and through, and I do not want him to feel like he is any less loved or any lesser or treated any differently just because he didn't come out of my body. And so it was really important to me always to feel like, okay, I'm going to treat this child the same way I would treat a child that does come out of my body in the future generation if we have kids, inshallah. Um, and, you know, I didn't with Sharif have, you know, when I met him because he was five already, I didn't have the experience of sort of the mother-son bonding that takes place between zero and five. So it's kind of like I jumped in at five, and he was already, you know, a little person that was very well developed and already had been introduced to God and, you know, knew about prayers and what it meant to be Muslim. And he, he had something much better than than what I could offer because he had the professor and he had the professor's mother to introduce him to all of that. Um, and for me, I was like so new in my journey again. It's like, you know, I would play a very different role because I was developing and changing as a person. Like, I was not at all comfortable in my skin, and I was sort of developing myself alongside Sharif as he grew up. Um, so fast forward about 10 years, um, and, you know, that was when um, we had Nito. And so 10 years passed, and I was 10 years further along in my own development, and I certainly felt more comfortable in my skin but I was 38 and pregnant, and it was like, okay, now I have this new, new adventure to, to embark on, and the idea of being a new parent starting from age zero, and what would that mean, and you know, rethinking, like, how do I want to introduce you know, God and faith and stuff? I mean, there are a million people who are gonna be better at me than things like you know, discipline, and bedtimes, and nutrition, and activities, and all of those sorts of things, because I didn't have necessarily great role models for that, but I didn't care. To me, the most important thing, if there was anything I was going to get right, it was teaching my child to love God and know God and have sort of the tools to be a person. And that was, you know, really instrumental in my thinking that, um, you know, this, this child is not like someone I own, not an extension of me, not someone that would be, um, you know, my servant or something like that but someone who's actually a little person and a little seeker of God like me. And he only is different because he came through to this earth through my body and he came after me. 
but ultimately he and I are both going to be seekers of God. And we know from our tradition that, you know, children are a trust and um, that we, you know, they're a gift and they're in our charge. So we don't own them and that we will be held accountable for how we raise our children. And I felt, you know, so strongly about that whole concept that my, I wanted, you know, my attitude to be like, okay, this is a little person, so no baby talk. You know, I didn't do the, oh, kitty, kitty. I would just talk to him. You know, I mean, age appropriately, of course, but, you know, I just spoke to him as a person. And I wanted to instill in him, I mean, understanding that babies, when they come, you know, they're the closest to God in terms of, like, a sense of dignity and a sense of wholeness and worth. And I believed that it was my job to really, like, emphasize those qualities like, I wanted my child to feel dignity and worth. And when it, you break it down into its component parts, what makes up dignity and worth? It's love, stability, um, security, um, you know, certainly um, respect, kindness, mercy, you know, all of the qualities that we talk about here. And so, you know, it was, it was a, um, you know, really important for me to learn as much as I could because I felt like I, I didn't, have a lot of in my well to draw from. So I started reading a lot of baby books and you know how to be a good parent. And the book that actually really resonated with me was about attachment parenting. And it's this idea that um, you like literally are attached to your baby for the first year. So it's like the baby's in the womb and has the comfort and security of being you know, in the mother. But as soon as the baby comes out, like I would wear him in my pouch pretty much you know whenever I could. So he was always sort of attached to me. Um, you know, I definitely breastfed and, um, you know, did co-sleeping, which is where the baby sleeps, you know, in the, um, in the bed with you. Um, and, of course, it's not for everyone, but this is just, like, what resonated with me intuitively as a mother. And also the idea, you know, like, everyone gets into this little, you know, well, should I let the baby cry it out or should I pick him up? And I felt very strongly that, no, you don't let him cry it out. I would pick, pick him up. I mean, and, and reading from these books, it's like the understanding that, you know, when a child is crying and has a response where the parent actually comes and, you know, responds to that, that's a way that you're teaching that, that you know, teaching the baby that he's safe and he's secure. And if he's calling for help, that someone will come help him. And there are studies that have shown that when you actually do things that way, um, the baby's development is much better because they feel, they feel safety, they feel comfort, they're not worried that someone's not going to be there, um, and that they actually then proceed to the next stage, which is when they start venturing out into, you know, other surroundings and, and learning other things because they've already established in their mind that they're safe and they're secure. So it's okay to go out and explore. And with babies that don't have that experience where they were left to cry, cry themselves to sleep, they don't often get to that next stage because they're, they're like still in that area of anxiety where they don't really know if I cry and I'm upset, is someone going to actually come help me? And I thought, you know, that's really interesting. You, you have to feel secure and stable, you know, to feel love. Um, so uh, that, you know, like I said, it's, it's not um, for everyone, but I think that for me, the reasons were really compelling. Um, and so, and as soon as, um, okay, no, we can talk. Sorry, again, my sleep depri deprivation levels and my memory are not great, so please forget the paper. Truth is, I was like, forget the paper. I'm like, okay, well, I need it today, sorry. Um, so anyway, so in terms of like, you know, building that, that sense of love, I mean, like I, you know, for me, I know for all the things that I was angry at my parents for, or all the things that I had experienced growing up, I always at least felt loved. And it's like when everything goes wrong, you know, when you feel like your mother loves you, that's that can help you strength, you know, to carry through. Um, when Mito, like, then um, got to, you know, got old enough where he could actually engage me, <clears throat> engage me, like, more around the age of two or so, then I would actually start talking to him um, about God and just kind of, you know, very, actually, well, two, he didn't really understand that. But, I mean, it was starting the habit of kind of saying, oh, you know, we're together, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, I would engage him. And I felt that it was really important, like, even if he, as he was growing up, even if, if he was really little, and he was talking to me about whatever, the dog, the crayon, you know, the playground, whatever, I would really make an effort to listen and look him in the eye and go, oh, really? Okay, and even ask him questions. 
So I wanted him to have the feeling that what he was saying to me was important. I mean, obviously it wasn't important to me. I don't care about, you know, the grass and, you know, the crown of the nose or anything like that. But where he was in his development as a little person, it was important for him to feel like his parents cared what he was saying and that, you know, that he could talk to me and engage me and, and feel like it was important. And so I, you know, that I made um, a real conscious effort to do that throughout. And also, you know, kids, they never really want to feel like they're alone. So I, you know, would often talk to him about God through this, where it's like, well, listen, you know, you're never really alone because, you know, God is with us. And, um, and I would always try to cast God in a very loving light. Like, look at how wonderful God is. God chose me to be your mom and chose you to be my son. And that's, you know, amazing, right? Um, and then as he got older, you know, it would be more like, um, I would just insert God in sort of different ways. Like, you know, God is, and you know, like when he was alone, I would say, okay, if you're ever scared of something and I'm not here, you can think, you know, God knows what's going on with you. God is with you. God's your protector. You know, if you're on the playground and someone's mean to you and no one saw it, well, God saw it. <laughs> and don't worry, you know, God will take note. So you're never alone. Um, and, you know, and I would always say to him, well, you know, like the point of us in this world is to be as kind and as good and as loving as we can be because we want to be together forever, right? You know, and so when you're a little kid, you're like, yeah, I want to be with you forever. And so, you know, always do your best to be close to God and be nice. And, you know, one day we will be together forever with all the people that we love and all the great people. So it was like answering some of the questions also that he had because kids actually, when they're very young, start asking you questions about, well, what's going to happen when I die? What's going to happen to me? And so I felt it was really important to have an answer for him and to explain it and to talk about it, you know, and, and not be afraid to say, I don't know, which is another really important thing. Like, I grew up with the idea that parents are supposed to know everything, they're supposed to be perfect, you know, and I felt it was really important to say, I don't know, let's find out, let's ask, you know, and let's seek knowledge, let's seek truth. Um, so, um, the other thing that was also really important was modeling some of these other things that I wanted them to teach. So, and modeling empathy and charity, for example. So one of the, I think one of the most miraculous things about when you have a baby or have a child is when you start seeing them sort of say things that you say and kind of act in ways that you act and you're like, oh my God. It's really cute because it like, you know, you feel like, oh my gosh, this is like a person that looks like me and is acting like me. But then you also realize the weight of that responsibility because they're watching you and they're watching you know, the models that you set, right, and, and the role that you play. So, um, you know, I would always, like, um, we would be together and, you know, he would see what I would do. So oftentimes, you know, like, for example, if we're walking or we're somewhere and someone would trip or someone would, you know, have come across some kind of issue, I would always make a point to go and say, oh, are you okay? Is there anything that I can do? And so he saw me do this many times. And so I was really, like, amazed and happy when one day we were at his school and he was on the playground and a kid fell over and then he ran up to the kid and he's like, are you okay? And I was like, oh, okay, good, good job. <laughs> or, you know, if we're like driving in the car and you know, in Los Angeles, there are a lot of people who are on the streets asking for money. So oftentimes I would, you know, stop, pull over the car and hand someone either money or a bottle of water or whatever I had. And he would see that. And I wanted him to see it because I wanted him to feel like, don't be shy to help someone. And I would take the time to explain, you never know if you could be on that street. What if this were you? How would you feel? And would always try to bring into the conversation, you know, like look and imagine yourself in that person's shoes. And, you know, so I think that that was a really important lesson for him, that now it's very normal for him to sort of see and reach out and help people. Um, and one of my other favorite things, which is kind of odd, is that a lot of times I fumble over things and I will go, oh my God, I am such an idiot. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. And now I regularly hear Mito in the other room going, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that was really important for a number of reasons. I grew up as a perfectionist under the idea that I better be right, I better be good, I better do everything perfect or I'm gonna be in trouble. And, you know, and parents were perfect and children were not. I wanted to break through that and say, no, it's okay. Parents are human. Parents make mistakes. You don't have to be perfect. It's okay, you know, to be honest about it and be the first one to call yourself an idiot because it's a humbling thing. 
And it's like a very liberate, liberating thing to tell people, I'm an idiot. You know, just it's like a, it's a nice um, way to relieve yourself of certain pressures. And along those lines, if I ever did something to hurt him or embarrass him, like on the way here, actually, I embarrassed him um, by asking him to carry bags. And in front of our guests, I said, he's the muscle man. And he came up to me and was like, Mom, why did you call me the muscle man? That was really embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And so I apologized. And I said, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you. And I felt like it's always really, it was always really important for me to apologize whenever I did something wrong or if I hurt him or I disappointed him because I wanted to acknowledge that his feelings mattered and that they were important and that I could be, you know, I could hurt someone, but I could make up for it. And I wanted him to learn that behavior. So um, that was my idiot story. <laughs> um, okay, and then humor, of course, is something that I think is so important because humor keeps you young, it keeps you empathetic, because if you say something to be funny, by definition you have to know what's funny to the person that you're talking to and trying to be funny with. And so it pushes you to think also in terms of like, you know, your, your child and his stage of development, what would he find funny? Of course, I'm not gonna engage in like, you know, behavior like that, but hope I can say something that's funny, you know, like kids like to hit each other and sons especially, but so I didn't do that, but I would try to say things that were funny. And you know, it's like it brings a levity to the house and makes you connect in ways that, you know, my parents never, they didn't even, they couldn't laugh about anything. Like, it was so rare when they would laugh and I was so happy when they would laugh. But it just was something that wasn't part of like my upbringing and I thought was really important. We try to laugh a lot. Um, and it also helps for when, the times when you have to get really serious because you know that there's, there's a balance, you know, and that there's some things that when they're wrong, they're called out, but then at other times, you know, it's okay and it's, it's fun to laugh with your parents. It actually makes them realize that you're human beings too and not just these scary people. Um, so I, so I kind of have uh, also a few like kind of never break rules. So one was like, always keep your promise. Like if you, and this was also for my mother, like she remembers from her childhood that, you know, people would promise her things and they would never come through. So it was important for me to like, to say, okay, if I wasn't sure I could keep a promise, I wouldn't make it. And I would say, you know what, I can't make that promise to you because I don't know if I can keep it and I have to be able to keep my promises. And this teaches kids to honor their word and honor promises and that they mean something. And for us as Muslims, you know, what does inshallah mean? No, right? Or that's kind of like what people joke about. Oh yeah, can we go to Islam? Yeah, inshallah, inshallah, right? But then this actually gives inshallah its true meaning, which is it's like, yeah, I really do intend to do this with you and I'm gonna promise that I'm gonna try and do this or I don't know if I can promise, but you know, if God wills and blah, 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 you know, it becomes something that you can count on and hopefully we teach him that it matters when you make a promise and you keep your work. Um, also that, um, this is something I learned from the professor's mother, which is always tell your kids where you are. Like sometimes people like just kind of run off and like, oh, I'm just gonna go to the store, oh, I'm blah, blah, blah. But kids, I mean, even if it's like, oh, I'm, you know what, I'm gonna go take a bath, I'm gonna go take a shower, I'm just gonna take the dog out for a walk. You know, I make a point to always have, you know, my kids or Mito know where I am. Because I think it's a point of security. It's, you know, it's anxious when you don't know where your mom is. And so it's, and I don't even think it's something that he will recognize or realize, but I think it's a really important source of comfort. And um, prayer for a Muslim family. One of the most valuable things that um, I felt in my own personal development as a Muslim was seeing like the professor, the professor's mom, family members just pray very naturally. Like it was, you need to pray, you just get up, you pray in the living room, it doesn't matter who's watching you, you just do it, it's part of your life, you know? And this was actually very much the same way that I introduced the idea of God to Mito, which is like, God is very natural, God is very, it's sort of a big deal and not a big deal, right? God is with us, wherever we're doing, it's like as natural as drinking water, it's as important and as constant as air, the air we breathe, but it's also very important, you know, because God can help you in every situation. Like you are not, you know, you're empowered when you're with God. So but praying, I think, in your home where your kids can see you regularly. Um, I mean, it's better if they will pray with you. But even if they don't pray with you, 
that you pray in front of them and that it's nothing, it's not a big deal. Um, but that you see that it's important to your parents. And hopefully, if even if you eventually stray away, you'll always remember that that was something that was an anchoring point for your parents. Um, laugh a lot, hug a lot, um, love a lot, say I love you a lot. Um, this was something that was not really that big in my upbringing. But interestingly, um, so Mito and I are kind of, you know, in the in the habit where it's just become, okay, love you, bye, love you, love you, love you, everything is sort of love you, love you. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, but it's, it's part of like our engagement with each other. And we hug each other a lot and he always feels like he's happy to be bigger than me and grab me and like, you know, um, but so we hug a lot. And, um, and interestingly, when we call my mom, like my grandmother, his grandmother, now we've gotten in the habit, like when we talk to her, we'll always say, love you, bye, love you, bye. And it used to like be like, like, I could just feel like in her this discomfort. And recently, she said it first. <laughs> so I was like, see, if love is infectious. So, but I think that these kinds of things, you know, like when, when I think about like people's emphasis on like ritual versus sort of what is foundationally important as a character of a human being, like, you know, I had the opportunity, we had the opportunity to put Mito in Islamic school, and Shreve went to Islamic school for a little bit. And it was a really traumatic experience because it was really focused on ritual. And um, for Mito, like, I thought about putting him in, you know, the Islamic school here, and I went to visit it. I thought about putting him in the Sunday school, I went to visit it. I left running and screaming because I was like, oh my God, if I put him in this, he's going to hate this religion. And it's the same feeling that I got watching this YouTube video of his counselor. You know, like, uh, he would, I'm sure he would be embarrassed to go himself or bring any of his friends there. And why is that? It shouldn't be that way. But so, but I wanted to, you know, so now he goes to Catholic school where they're more Islamic than they are anything else from, you know, what I can tell. Um, but I, you know, I felt it was really important to really hone in on those values, you know, with the kindness, the empathy, um, loving people, um, thinking about what it's like to be in other people's shoes, and understanding, like, you know, okay, we live in a, in a beautiful society. We never have to think about, you know, having problems eating when we're hungry. We can drink Starbucks every day, you know, boba, whatever, you know. But, so we're really blessed and we're really grateful for that, but that also comes with a responsibility, and that means that we have to be sensitive, sensitive to people who don't have what we have, and also that the burden falls on us to do a lot more good in the world because God is going to hold us ultimately more accountable to have done more because we got more. Um, but anyway, so these were just some thoughts that were important for me because I think that the opportunity to critically think about your role as whether it's a spouse or a parent or a convert to a faith or even, you know, like someone who is already Muslim and trying to reestablish their connection to God, understanding that you can make the choice, you can put the hard effort and work into, you know, learning, thinking about what is, what should be aspirational, and then doing the hard, not being afraid to do the hard work to put it into play. And if, you know, one thing doesn't work, try another. But like, again, the idea of being very vibrant in your, in how you live your faith and, and what you leave your children with. Like, I'm really proud, you know, some of the people here have met Mito and interacted with him and said, you know, he's a really special kid and he's very confident and he's, you know, very lovely. I mean, you know, there's a flip side of that too because sometimes when I get mad at him, he's like, you have to respect me. <laughs> and part of me is like, wait a minute, you're the kid, you have to respect me. But then I go, no, 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 alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that's what I want. I want him to have a sense of dignity about him, to be able to stand up and communicate, you know, and, and think about what it means to be like a God-loving person and that, you know, and that he can do a lot of good in the world and that his job is to do a lot of good in the world. And I tell him, you know, part of your job growing up and going to school is figuring out what you're good at, what you're not good at, what you're passionate about, and how you can put that together to serve God. And, um, and I think that's really important. So, you know, and it takes a village to raise our kids. We obviously need a lot of work and uh, sharing a lot of knowledge and, so, you know, I just share this as kind of food for thought, and hopefully, you know, I, I would always love to know more about what works with people, but this is a huge challenge for all of us, is how we prepare our next generation to, you know, appreciate Islam and love and beauty, 
Like it hurts me when love is not associated with our faith, but it's so easily and readily associated with Christianity and others. You know, I, I don't like the fact that you know, non, non-believers are more kind and more open and more tolerant than Muslims themselves. That's a real problem. So, um, so that's it. So thank you for listening.